Well, this is a new area. It's very big. Yeah, I want to say that I'm identifying what that is in the background as a pretty basic task manager, maybe? It actually looks like assembly, but not in any assembly language I've ever seen. Well, someone's playing a uh, Zactronics game in the forums. Maybe we can ask them about it. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the Shenzhen IO. Yeah, I have a copy of that. I'm, I'm too scared to open it, though. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how well I would do with it. I think I'd seen it at one point. It was just like, well, you know, it's 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 a game. And it's probably a game I would be good at, but it's kind of a dad game. You know what I mean? Sort of. There's nothing wrong with that. But when I say like dad games, I. Guess what? The Mimic knew we were talking about other games and so right. decided to jump in. I guess it did. Let's just go ahead and skip that because I didn't forget this time. Oh, the Zachtronics. No, we can still talk about Zachtronics. Okay, so the thing is, every Zachtronics game I've seen seems to me like a dad game. And when I say a dad game, I mean games that aren't really like games or just things your dad plays after work. You know what I mean? Okay. Like Arma 2, stuff like the Zachtronics games, that sort of thing, where the goal is just screwing around and playing with it. All right. Anyway, I, I don't know. I'm just not a huge fan of, of dad games. On looking at it, I definitely say that, uh, you know, I'd probably have uh, a really hard time getting all the way through it, given the depth and complexity of what I've seen in the likes of the, of the Threads playthrough. Also, is it just me or is the football helmet really, really good? It had like plus 12 defense or something. Well, it is a football helmet, so I imagine if you were looking for something to get the job done, the uh, modern football helmet has probably got you covered. Yeah, it's better than nothing, I guess. It did, it did protect me from a near-death experience one time. You'll have to tell me about that sometime. Maybe I Preferably will. Preferably without the near-death part. Well, the near-death's what makes it funny. Well, I do just want to hear about what situation could possibly cause you to end up in a football helmet. Well, it involved playing football, believe it or not. Say it ain't so. What can I say? Uh, we all make we all make decisions we're not proud of at some point in our lives, right? Anyway, back on track. Uh, what exactly are we? Uh... Are we trying to find around here? I have no idea. Another limb, I guess. I don't know what this is a reference to, if this is a reference to anything. Maybe this familiar woman is just one of one of the many ascenches in the wild. Hmm. I guess at this point we can certainly mention uh, something that was brought up in the thread with regards to this dungeon in particular. Apparently, when this game was being playtested still, one of the devs had their significant other play through it, and apparently it was so affecting to them that they vomited, and the dev took this as a very good sign of what they had accomplished. Well, they accomplished something in that they made their wife and or SO vomit. Yeah, that's about as far as I think we can say an accomplishment's been made when talking about Y2K. I wouldn't call that an accomplishment. I mean, I guess a thing has happened, but it's not like a positive thing. I don't know how you could hold that up as a sign of your incredible game design prowess. LP talk! <laughs> Frankly, I'm just sort of fishing for the possible angle from which you might approach this. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I can't look at that and say that it's, it's, you know, I can't look at that and say that it's analogous to the idea of making a good, like, schlocky horror film or something, right? Yeah. Because the thing about a schlocky horror film is that oftentimes 
the schlock, you know, it's part of the appeal there. You sort of like appreciate how bad it is because it wraps around to being good. Except in the case of genuine suspense type psychological horror of the Alfred Hitchcock type. In particular, Stephen King has a bunch of really good essays on this. Right. And this doesn't really meet either of those requirements. It's just sort of shocking gore for shocking gore's sake, I guess. Yeah. At one point in the thread, I had mentioned being able to survive a pure Paolo Pasolini movie. And I feel like for all the faults those films have, there's... Uh, I think part of why they're so graphic in some ways is that it's just to make sure that they do leave an impression, that they do actually create some sense of some sense of lasting, even if the even if the subject matter is a little bit uh, well, way out in left field. I guess that makes sense. Like you just remember that you watched it because you have that you have the the strength of the imagery to go on rather than it being particularly noteworthy in terms of plot or characters or structure or whatever. Right. Yeah, I guess that that's somewhat emblematic of the whole idea of surrealism in film, isn't it? Well, surrealism can really accomplish a pretty wide variety of objectives. I mean, if you're taking a look at, say, a Luis Buñuel movie, they've definitely managed to... He's definitely managed to make surrealism work in the sense of... Uh-oh. Yep. Oh, okay. It didn't. It didn't ruin anything. Good. Yeah, I actually kind of wanted to see if it would if it would play ball with me, and it did. So small victories game. Unfortunately, now we have to figure out how to get that door anywhere else because we can't just skateboard with it. I mean, I didn't see an attempt to skateboard with it. Are the two actually mutually exclusive? The two are in fact mutually exclusive. If you start screwing around with the skateboard, you can't actually carry the door with you. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, as I was saying, like, uh, one of my favorite surrealists is probably Luis Buñuel, and his whole deal was that you can use surrealism as a facet of social commentary or use it in a way that allows you to, uh, allows you to somewhat, in a tongue-in-cheek manner, make some critique of society or just the circumstances you as an individual might find yourself in. And did he do any films that are in the popular culture, I guess. Well, he was active for mostly the, I want to say mostly the 40s and 50s. I could. Oh, I see. Okay. No, no, that doesn't sound right in retrospect. Um, he was a contemporary of Salvador Dali as well, hence, you know, why I can bring this up now. But uh, I, I would say if you if you ever get the chance, the obscure object of desire is a pretty good um, surreal satire. A bit like if if there was a Monty Python movie that almost seemed like it was trying to take itself seriously. That's a frightening idea. And that kind of makes it a little bit funnier in a way. Huh, okay, so it's like, what, a grimdark meaning of life or something? Yeah, if you will. Uh, no, wait, actually it's the... I want to say it was called the Death of Liberty. That's the one I'm thinking of. The obscure object of desire is more like a is more like a parody of a romantic drama. I see. And it's uh, <laughs> it's. I don't know how I managed to get myself into this state of affairs. <laughs> I will say that uh, this state of affairs resulted in me talking about Luis Buñuel movies. So maybe it can't be all bad. No, I'm cool with it. Mm. We've managed to find one of these switches. The way this works is that there are multiple switches throughout this area, and every single one of them will cause different blue platforms to appear. And, you know, you can walk across the blue platforms, which allows you to get the door where you need to go. Right. Like so. And in that respect, it's actually a pretty straightforward pathfinding puzzle. But uh... yeah, it is. There was just a lot of experimenting I had to do to figure out what what goes where. Mm -hmm. There was something back there? 
Yeah, there was actually a monster back there, but you couldn't see it very well because the, the pillars were in the way. Huh. I don't know if that was like a deliberate enemy placement or if it just sort of happened to be back there. But no matter. We will wipe it out with LP toss like we do everything else in this dungeon. LP toss! I'll be damned if I'm about to correctly gauge the developer's intent at this point. I didn't know what happened here, if it makes you feel any better. Huh. <laughs> what happened here is we were determined to happen upon a new glitch. Well, yes. Uh, so, in fact, I'm over on the left. Yeah. You may remember that I entered this second floor from the opposite area. Uh, I, doing this, it almost feels like I'm kind of levitating, like, halfway between the floor and the other one, but I, I happen to... Is, is this why the dev's significant other vomited? That's a good question, actually. Huh. Maybe. Uh, anyway, I do finally manage to figure out that I'm actually over on the left there. Uh, and so if I just do a little bit of walking, I will eventually come back into frame. But it's like the camera is fixed here. This strikes me as a bug. Yeah, um, what I think might have happened there, and I don't know very much about game dev at all. So again, I open myself up to the possibility of being utterly unbelievably wrong, is that the enemy that was back behind those pillars actually wasn't that they were stored somewhere just off frame somehow and that you did run into them and then the game sort of interpreted oh because he ran into this enemy then his position must be over here and you weren't well but obviously. the game still the game's camera still tracked you as being there I'm not sure what happened there, but I'll tell you what, it really it really threw me for a loop. Because if you remember, this was actually in the same recording session as I did the last episode in, because I usually go in like two episode chunks. Right. And uh, I hadn't found a save spot since like maybe, maybe 45 minutes before this point. <laughs> so I was actually pretty freaked out. It came as something of a relief to learn that, in fact, I can continue playing. Though it did leave me with maybe a year or two off my lifespan. I was pissed. It gave you another opportunity to use LP Toss and remind me of the fact that at some point I needed to make a joke about the movie Shaun of the Dead and how that actually pioneered the world's first LP Toss. God, I love Shaun of the Dead. Are you talking about the scene in the bar? No, I'm talking about uh, Purple Rain. No, Sign of the Times. Definitely not the Batman soundtrack. Throw it. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the one, the one where they're in the bar and they put the jukebox on, uh, and then it's Queens. Don't stop me now. That's also a fantastic scene, but the LP toss specifically is that starts with no. That was the second album I ever bought, and then uh, they start throwing Sean's LP collection at an approaching pair of zombies. Yeah. And it turns out that LPs are a profoundly ineffective weapon against zombies. Imagine that. It's not like they're made of plastic or anything. Anyway, so if y'all haven't watched Shaun of the Dead, I would thoroughly recommend it. Hot Fuzz as well. I haven't seen the third one. Those are definitely some movies that have, uh, that have postmodern chic going on. Oh, yes. No, that's how you do a postmodern film. Especially a postmodern zombie film in the case of Shaun of the Dead. Mm. Or a postmodern cop movie in the case of Hot Fuzz. Or a postmodern. I want to say apocalypse movie in the sense of. Uh, or alien invasion movie. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that sounds about right. I'll have to take your word for it. In the again, case of The World's it. End, that's the third one. Yes. So you can see that green door is over there on the far right. Let's go ahead and pick that up. So the trick is finding the right combination of switches to allow you to carry the door to the place that it needs to go. Correct. But that's all the way over here. And naturally, we don't have a way off of this island. True, but you can definitely approach it one island at a time at this point. Yes, you can. 
So I guess we're just going to have to kind of leave it here for the time being and see if we can find ourselves another switch that we can use to get it to another island. Ideally one that goes north. You'll sort it out soon enough, I'm sure. I will. I'm quite good at that. So, I guess what I might ask at this point is what are you anticipating might come next in terms of this very visually strange but ultimately uh, contextually unremarkable level we're finding ourselves in? Well, I don't know. You know, when they start when they start pulling out the surrealism card, all bets are off, I guess. Uh, what I'm kind of expecting will happen is that, you know, this this game I don't know is really capable of like surprising me uh, at this point. So I'm expecting there will be another great big boss or another 20 or 30 minute exposition cutscene after we find uh, what was her name? Wendy? The wall? Yes. Yeah, so once we find Wendy, all of her limbs, I assume that we'll be able to continue forward and, you know, I'll probably get another 20 or 30 minutes of exposition that I probably won't pay any attention to. But hopefully it puts us that much closer to finishing this game. That As say, opposed to just giving me 20 minutes at the beginning and letting me go. Yeah, because really the there seems to be kind of a distinct visual theme associated with each area of this dungeon that we're going through. But the key problem is that there's, well, again, very little that connects them as far as we can judge so far. We're just encountering these various women who have fairly broad philosophical statements to make as we run into them, but no real sense of how exactly they fit into all of this or, again, where the connective tissue is between their feelings and the overall greater theme of this dungeon or its story. So actually having the Essentia step in, say, on a room-to-room -room basis in order to provide a bit more context for those things is potentially more valuable an approach. Yeah, I think that would be a much better way of handling this, and I, I think that would go a long way toward just keeping me engaged with whatever the hell is going on. Um, you know, so far, we've we've kind of seen a bunch of these little, like, they're, they're not really fleshed out enough to be characters. I'd almost call them cameos of these alternate essentials. Yeah. And that's fine and all. I appreciate that. But if you want to be respectful of the player's time, you know, don't give me just a bunch of babble that doesn't mean anything to me. What would go a long way toward uh, toward fleshing out the Essentia 2000 as a character would be a discussion, you know, where they basically kind of have to give me their elevator pitch, I guess, about what they're all about. Like, you really want to conserve how much they say and make sure that every word they say is actually advancing whatever you want that character to be about. Precisely. The closest comparison I can think of, again, aside from Yume Nikki, is that right at, towards the end of Earthbound, there's a sequence that occurs inside of the character's own imaginary world called Magicant. And throughout that, there's not really a lot of consistency between what goes on there and what's been established through the rest of the story, but it is fundamentally just a fairly intimate look at the character's own perspective on things in terms of things like, oh, you encounter just memories of people you've met in throughout the years. At one point, you end up happening upon one of the villain's main underlings who asks if you would forgive him and go back to being friends after the adventure's over, even if on some surface level you're aware that's not possible. That's actually kind of heartfelt in a way. Oh, yeah. I love when games do stuff like that. There's also a, a great sequence in the first Austin Powers where he murders a mook and that shows like how his family copes with the fallout and that sort of thing. I right. Like my body I actually like when 13. games do that. The memories here are very painful. 
So please, bear with me, as I can only tell parts of the story. And yet, here we are. I live to see Do we like how this game's doing this? Contrasina, Switzerland. I had four brothers. My brothers and I rarely spoke, as I was much younger than them. My father was always away on business, and my mother was a teacher at my local school. I spent most of my time alone, wandering the Pontresina Valley. I dreamed about writing. Did you notice her world. lips twitch there for a minute? In that valley? Yeah. I found another world. The world of my other selves. Getting lost in solitude is the quickest way to otherworldliness. Someone who is surrounded by others can achieve this, but only if they are selfless. So. If what does this so say about person, the valley? Is the valley the just like some itself? magical location that lets you reach across worlds? Is that what's going on here? I want to say it's more that her of sensation of total solitude is something that allowed her to become aware object. of these things, but in solitude, I'm more distracted at the very strange windows onto her forehead that her bangs were creating for a second there. I noticed that too. It was kind of weird. I realize now how much potential I had in that life and how much of it was wasted by entering the soul space prematurely. Let us continue. This is only our first stop on our tour of my parallel lives. Oh, goody. I guess it just boots us back out to the main menu or something. Now that we've accomplished this part of the sightseeing tour. Yeah, beyond that, uh, the theme of location as... Is that a hot dog? as metaphor for self-enlightenment is something that Celeste had been doing previously. So I don't know if that if the game could have ripped off of that in any way, but I'd have no doubt that they would have had they known about it and it was popular at the time of this game's development. I've not played Celeste. Neither have I, frankly. I just heard a bit about it from uh, friends after the fact. I just know that if I were to play it, I feel as though as someone who isn't terribly partial to platformers to begin with, I would probably get very tired of the, well, very intense challenge involved in it. I don't know, I do okay with platformers. If it's that good, I might play it, actually. Well, then I, as far as platformers go, I'm told it's, uh, it's a very rewarding one to play through. So we're three of the four limbs of the way there. We have to figure out how to find that last one. If I remember, we actually found the last sort of big open area. It's on top of that staircase. Yeah, I want to say that it's possible it's still in the infinite room somewhere, but... Oh man, wouldn't that be great? I'm pretty sure we explored the hell out of the infinite room. Well, I guess it'll have to wait till next time. I guess so.